Warning, this is a deep dive. This is my first welder. It's a DC inverter welder, also known as a stick welder. I removed these screws from this housing here, exposing the inside of the unit. We've got some very interesting intellectual property going on in here. Give you a careful look at the board logic there. It's a cooling fan in the back. These metric inset hex nut tightened fittings over here are for the negative on the top and positive on the bottom output that goes out the front there like that. Here's the control knob and LCD. We can see if we go in here, there's some daughter boards like that, low voltage control. And we see some capacitors, inductors, huge capacitors, some relays. Here's the power input from the wall. We're on 110 American style here. We see it enters here. There's an on off switch wired up. So you can see how that's wired up. This cable is for the cooling fan, goes behind the there and there's the cooling fan wires. We see a giant um, transformer inductor, another one here. This is the other side of those metric tightening things for that. So those are very securely attached to the logic board. We see this wire here for that low voltage panel, suspiciously close to this electromagnetic field here, but I imagine the interference isn't significant. There's a tiny little transformer with the yellow down there, like that. See some a resistor, some diodes, some other capacitors, more board level control components down there. If we move along over here, we see the same capacitors, resistors. Over there, a transistor, actually, right there, and some more board level diodes and capacitors. Another inductor of some kind. Inside the base of these aluminum extrusion uh, heat sinks are the high power IGBTs. You can kind of spy them if you very carefully peek around. Uh, they're, they're screwed down. I don't know if you can see it in there. They're screwed down in there. And the same is true over here. Um, you'd have to peek through the edge over there. It's, it's hard to see, but there's high power transistors, um, IGPTs inside these heat sinks. These are to dissipate the heat from the transistors. Those are the switching transistors. So there's a, a look, here's the back panel. You see the speaker or the um, fan grill, the on off switch. And let's go around to the front. You can see that there's an airflow path like that. They lined everything up so that the fan blowing the air through there goes through the heat sinks to exchange the heat. There's some lights there. Um, the green one on the, or the yellow one on the bottom with little temperature, uh, this one right here. If that turns on, it means the unit's overheating. This MMA 140D unit from Hone here is only rated at a 60% duty cycle. The control here um, allows you to vary from 10 amps now, typically 35 or so is going to be the minimum for stick welding, and it can go up to 100. Uh, this is a low power unit for light welding. I bought this for an exhaust repair project. It was only $89 uh, total with a $10 off coupon on Amazon. Have one more look at those nice thick trace paths on that logic. This is a uh, industrial power board, so it's much more robust. Maybe you can tell they're real thick. Uh, nickel plated uh, inlays there. Everything, nice thick solder pads. The components are, um, the heat sinks are screwed down here and, and ground bonded. Um, really well designed. Unfortunately, <clears throat> I had to avoid the, the warranty to open it. I just sliced it with a razor blade right along the edge of the case there. 
While we're in here, let's have a look at the bottom stickers. This is where um, the owner's manual references. These are the electrical specifications here. And it even gives you a diagram of the type of air cooling um, that you want if we're using it on 110 volts in North America or 220. They even include an adapter from a 240 uh, to a normal NEMA 15R. Um, those are the welding cables here, like this. That plug into the unit. Underneath, you can see I got some welding rods. Those are 611 welding rods, a pound of them. I think they're they're 40. 611. The kit includes this slag hammer that has a little metallic whacker and um, metallic brush wires. That's to scratch slag off of your welds. That was nice of them. It's a nice injection molded nylon handle, very strong type of plastic. Here's the stinger holder or the electrode holder. It's spring loaded like that. It has the multi position type that can hold the stick in different configurations diagonal, straight, and so forth. Copper in there. That's the end connector that plugs into the welder. This is the positive or the stick holder. This is the part that holds the welding stick. This beautiful nickel plated steel operation with copper bonded wire into a nut and bolt with copper inlay clamp here is the workpiece clamp or the ground clamp. And what we have going on here is this is going to electrically connect the ground part of this DC circuit via that connector right there to the welding unit. And this is what establishes the transfer of the electricity from the stick back to the unit, because this is direct current. So this is your, you could clamp this to the table too if you have a metal table or to the part directly. Here's a closer look at the 6 E6011 uh, 332nd or 2.4 millimeter. This is um, 0.45 kilograms or one pound. There's 30 rods, tigs or varillas, depending on which language you speak. We see that they print the label in multiple languages, so these can be sold all around the world. And 6011, this specific type of rod, is typically laid down as a first weld layer if you're um, welding multiple layers. I'm going to be welding relatively thin carbon steel exhaust tubing uh, with this. So this is perfectly sufficient and actually what welding masters recommended for that application. This is the instruction manual for the MMA140D by Hone. It's an inverter electric welder known as an IGBT model. This I'm not going to read in its entirety here, but actually explains the operating principle here. Um, we'll go over that section. So the single phase main input or AC from the grid goes into a rectify unit and condenser. The second block uh, contains transistors and driver switching, switching bridge or the very high powered transistors called IGBTs. This turns the main rectified voltage, so from AC to DC, into high frequency alternating voltage at 65,000 hertz. That's 65,000 cycles per second which permits power regulation according to the current voltage of the weld to be done. The third section is a high frequency transformer. The primary windings are fed by the voltage converted by block two. It has the function of adapting the voltage and current to the values required by the arc welding procedure and simultaneously isolates the welding circuit from the grid or what they call the mains so that it doesn't cause electrical damage to your home or building. For the secondary rectifier bridge with inductance, this changes the alternating voltage current supplied by the secondary winding into continuous current voltage at a low wavelength. So that rectifier converts it back to DC. 
And then the fifth block is the electronic regulation board, and it's constantly checking the value of the welding current against that selected by the user with the dial knob. It modulates the commands of the IGBT drivers, which control the regulation. This control board also determines the dynamic response of the current transient during the phases of electrode fusion, whether there's an instant short circuit when you strike, and is responsible for the safety system, which includes uh, an over automatic resetting thermal protection overheat, which they cover in the next section. So they refer to different figures, figure C, figure B, so forth, figure D, it explains up here that if the yellow light, which is normally off, is on, it means that it can't fall because the thermal protection is on, which means you used it so much that it's overheated. Once it cools off, it restarts. And if the, the voltage is outside the acceptable range, either from a 220 circuit above 260 or under 150, or if you're on 110, if it goes above 145 or under 85, the machine is blocked. It doesn't damage it, but it won't work. If the green light's on, it means it's ready to work. And the digital display shows the output, which is adjusted by the knob. There's a bunch of technical data here. This specific machine has grade H insulation, which is rated for 180 centigrade. They show you the formulas uh, for calculating that sticker that I showed you on the bottom. And there's more warnings about... Um, the electrode holder, things to avoid. Then it goes um, into French, the same version in French. And the interesting part is when we get to the back, here's the instructions in Spanish. There's the diagrams and they explain, these are what they were referencing in the text. So, if you refer back to those sections of the text, when it says figure and numbers, that's where you can understand. Now, this is possibly the coolest part because in a whole bunch of different languages, they give you a hint guide about welding. So this is what happens if you advance too slow with the rod. This is what happens if your arc is too short. That's what happens if your current is too low, it beads up. This is what happens if you advance too fast. This is what happens if your arc is too long, it spatters. This is what happens if your current's too high, it forms an etching bead. And then that's the ideal weld there. That's the correct current. So that's what you're going for in your material, whether you're joining or, uh, you know, whatever you're doing. Let me see, they describe the the tool holder there too. Well, there it is. I mean, you can tell by my hand or my wristwatch, this thing's small, it's really lightweight, maybe four pounds or something. Seems really light, maybe five, I don't know exactly, a couple kilograms. I think it's cute, mm. highly portable. You can take this anywhere, it works on a normal power outlet, so you can use it wherever. It even came with the adapter in case you have to plug it into 220. The unit works on either, uh, 110 or 220. This is IP21S, which means that in this position, dripping water, it's protected from dripping water. And uh, that's it. It's not meant for marine applications or salt spray or anything like that. It's just that if you happen to be outside working on your car and it starts lightly raining, that's gonna be okay. And conveniently, stick welding can work on dirty materials. So these sticks, I mean, many TIG welders actually have a, a stick welding function for that reason. Plus, I mean, these things are about as small and lightweight as they could be. So instead of using enormous uh, transformers, it uses small transformer inductor style um, IGBT switching control, which is effectively it's digital. Now this probably isn't going to last for, you know, five generations, something you pass down in your family. But if you got to do uh, work under your car and you live in an apartment complex like me, or you need to take this in your car and run it on a generator in the field, this is the kind of portable welder that you can use 
and they're so inexpensive that even if it doesn't hold up well, you're not embedded with humongous sunk costs. So. I should also note that I'm new to welding. I have stick welded before, though. Um, it was many years ago. I stick welded uh, some mild steel tubing into a motorcycle stand. My current motorcycle stand I just bought pre-assembled, but... Yeah, welding's interesting. Half the reason I went down this path is for all these tools, the auto darkening helmet like this, the Yes Welder, right? Uh, that There's the model number right there. Uh, the welder itself and the rods was only 150 bucks on Amazon. So my capital sunk costs are less than a fraction of what I was quoted for the repair from all the nearby shops within 50 miles of my location for the exact repair I'm going for. Well, thanks for watching, friends. Uh, welding is a very interesting technology. I highly recommend looking up how to stick weld or beginning uh, stick welding for beginners on YouTube. You can find a nice primer video. And um, this is the screwdriver I used to remove the case screws to look inside. Unfortunately, I had to slice the vo warranty void sticker here in order to open it, but I'm not really worried about that. It'll be interesting. I'll have an upcoming video of working on it. This is really just an explanatory unboxing. Thanks for watching. Cheers.